morning everybody this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College I want to do another episode in my series on the King James Bible and today we're going to look at the attempt to suppress Tyndale's translation now Tyndale's New Testament was available in London by the end of February 1526 copies were sold openly in a number of outlets including Master Garrett curate of all hallows in Honey Lane London England had um, a few had few enough printers in the 1520s none of them had had the, the courage to be able to go against the constitutions of Oxford which was a an explicitly prohibited the production of English Bibles in whole or in part <clears throat> the two most important English printers during the 1520s were Richard Pinson and Wiccan de Word responsible for something like 70% of the English book market. They could not compete, however, with the quality of the books, which came from foreign presses from over in Antwerp, Paris and Venice. Now, 17% of the books sold around this time in England were imported from the continent. And Antwerp was of special importance, not least on account of its geographical proximity to England at least 60 presses were operating in the Flemish port uh, alone during the first decades of the 16th century um, <clears throat> now the situation changed radically in 1520 for two reasons first the English printers began to lobby for protection against the foreign competition and the second was of greater importance, whereas the border controls effectively presented Protestant reformers such as Martin Luther or Hulrick Zwingli from gaining entry to England, it proved impossible to staunch the flow of their published works. There was a huge appetite for Luther's works and for Zwingli's works. Um, most official anger was directed against Luther's works. Although there had been public con con condemnation of Luther's works early in England, hostility toward his writings intensified early in 1526. John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, preached a public sermon against Luther and copies of his works, including the German New Testament, were publicly burned. This was dangerous times, wasn't it? Dangerous times. Uh, Luther, <clears throat> more writes, is a mad friar. I can't read all of this, by the way, because the language is so exceptionally bad. Bad language. Um, but um, More, who was considered to be a very mild man, he absolutely went apoplectic over Luther. Uh, a mad friar, a, a privy-minded rascal, with his ragings, and ravings with his filth and dung preoccupied with the privy's filth and dung you know this was vile language and this was the attitude that happened at that time and of course luther sometimes was just as vehement in return <laughs> very interesting was criticisms possess a unique degree of cru crudity and verbal violence uh, which is most unbecoming for uh, a minister of the uh, of the church and and someone pressed the panic button eventually Cuthbert Tunstall Bishop of London worked out and it is still not known how that the translation that was coming from Antwerp was the work of Tyndale and Roy on September the 24th 1526 he issued an injunction against the work and the next day he summoned London's booksellers included including all of the top booksellers and told them that they were to have no more of the sale of Luther's works and of Tyndale's New Testament in England and he arranged another public burning of the books <clears throat> and uh, Wol Wolseley had been very busy after briefing the bishops on the threat posed by the new translation. A decree was promulgated demanding that all true translations, all untrue translations, should be burnt. Amazing. Amazing, isn't it? 
Um, uh, England was a mercantile nation and hence imported a substantial quanti quantity and variety of legitimate goods. Smugglers were thus offered a rich choice of means by which contraband could be clandestinely brought to England. Port officers discovered all manner of means by which books could be concealed. A large cask of salt containing books and other religious papers, barrels of ore oil, were built with hidden watertight compartments inside, chests constructed with false bottoms. The smuggling of books was made much easier through the practice of supplying unbound books in the form of printed sheets, which could easily be concealed in cargoes of hides or bales of cloth or fabric. You know, very difficult to find sheets of paper. Um, uh, famously, uh, Augustus uh, Packleton uh, Tunstall mentioned how anx anxious he was to burn so many of Tyndale's new books. Uh, that uh, what, what happened was that the reformers played a trick on them. They said, oh, we can supply you with all of this contraband. We can supply these books to you. And funnily enough, the, the, um, uh, the, the amount of copies that were being supplied were actually funding more Bibles being produced. Can you imagine that? So they turned the um, they turned the, the the opposition to the Bible into a means of obtaining further funds to produce more Bibles. Does that make sense? <clears throat> um, Tyndale in 1534 had made a, a revision of the translation of the New Testament with some 5,000 alterations, generally to the improvement of the original. Now the, the revision was undertaking full knowledge that the religious situation in England was changing radically and possibly irrevocably. Um, Henry VIII was a new, had now alienated, was now alienated from the Pope and Thomas More, which is Tyndale's most severe critic, had resigned as Lord Chancellor um, and Thomas Cromwell was rising in royal favour and was rumoured to be sympathetic to the cause of the Reformation in general and of a vernacular Bible uh, in particular. Eventually Moore was executed at the Tower of London in, on July the 6th in 1534 on a charge of high treason and so ended his opposition to the production of the Bible in English. In the event, um, eventually um, Tyndale was tracked down. He lived abroad, he lived at, in, in Antwerp and uh, people got to know where he was and he was eventually betrayed and arrested in May 1535. Vigorous protests from the English government, especially from Thomas Cromwell, fell on deaf ears. Tyndale was strangled in October 1536 and his dead body was then burnt at the stake. Uh, Tyndale's fate is an important reminder that Bible translation was more than just a scholarly challenge in the early 16th century. It was, in Tyndale's case, illegal and dangerous and ultimately fatal. Um, as it happened, the first crack in the establishment appeared just a few months afterwards, after his, t after his arrest in December 1535, the Convocation of Canterbury, with representing the clergy of the Southern Promise of the Province of the Church of England, petitioned Henry VIII to rule that the Holy Scripture should be translated into the vulgar English lang language by certain good and learned men to be nominated by his majesty and should be delivered to the people for their instruction. The English clergy had pointedly turned their back on Tyndale's translation, but they had conceded to the need for an officially sanctioned Bible, which would be free, uh, distributed, freely distributed and read all over England, a vital corner had been turned in the story. And so in 1535, we have the first complete English Bible. 
and the first complete English Bible was produced by Miles Coverdale, the famous Miles Coverdale. Now, he was not a linguist by any stretch of the imagination. What he did was to depend upon the five sundry interpreters. Now then, he had a lot of people that he could turn to. He was very heavily dependent upon Tyndale's translation of the New Testament and the Pentateuch. And Coverdale also consulted two Latin translations of the Bible, the Vulgate, whose errors have been so piteously pointed out by Erasmus two decades earlier, and a more recent Latin translation undertaken by an Italian Dominican scholar, Sanctus Panini, in 1528. The remaining sundry uh, interpreters that Coverdale consulted were Luther's German translation of the Bible and a variant of the same translated um, in the Swiss German dialect of the Zurich region in Switzerland. One of the less felicitous aspects of this use of German translators is that Coverdale seems to have been have been given to minting new English words that were obviously literal representations of the original German, such as unoutspeakable. I mean, you know, you know, in one sense, Coverdale's translation is to be treated with some caution. Um, and um, it was not really a translation, really. It was just a combination, uh, to the best of his ability and knowledge, but a combination of all the other previous translations. And yet, despite this weakness, the work had one immense strength. It was the first English Bible to be published um, and thus constituted a landmark on the road to the King James Bible. The translation is rumoured to have found favour with Anne Boleyn, known for her Protestant sympathies. However, this turned out to be a disadvantage at a later time. Um, <clears throat> now, the story moves on. Thomas Cromwell, a powerful force in the struggle for the authorised English Bible, had hopes that Henry VIII might have given Coverdale's version his, his uh, coveted status. However, when Anne Boleyn fell from uh, favour and was executed, uh, Coverdale's translation lost all its appeal to the English king. Um, uh, and so <clears throat> the English printer and entrepreneur Richard Grafton had been busy for some years working on a production of an English Bible. And um, <clears throat> the text was edited by John Rogers, an associate of Tyndall's, and the work published in 1537 is often known as the Matthews Bible because of the pseudonym adopted by Rogers to protect his identity. The translation was produced and printed in Antwerp from where it would be exported to England. Now then, and so we move on. The uh, Bible had been given royal approval um, and um, was authorised for general sale. Henceforth, the title page of the Bible bore the words set forth with the king's most gracious license. And given the extent of the dependence of the version upon Coverdale's, the royal license was subsequently extended to all of Coverdale's works. Pressure now began to develop for an English Bible to be placed in every parish church in England. In part, this reflected a growing consensus that as a matter of principle, the people of England should be allowed to hear the Bible and to read it in their own language. The most effective way of countering the influence of, uh, pro uh, of potentially seditious, unauthorised translations was to flood the country um, with reliable and safe translations and insist that these should be read out loud during regular public worship. Um, um, the, 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 the king charged the cler clergy with this particular thing, that you shall provide on this side of the feast of all saints next coming one book of the whole bible of the largest volume in england in english and the same set up in some convenient place within the said church and that you have care for where 
whereas your parishioners may most commodiously resort to the same and read it, the charges of which book shall be ratedly borne between you and the parson and the parishioners aforesaid. That is to say, one half by you and the other half by them. So the king may have authorised the use of such a Bible, but he was he was not going to be paying for it. <laughs> no, he said that the parson and the people must pay for it themselves. Now, the next thing that happens is that Grafton was to be disappointed. A feature of the Matthews Bible that he believed to be a selling point became instead a sticking point. Grafton had included a large number of marginal notes in his Bible, following a precedent of many high, highly successful French Protestant translations um, earlier produced in Geneva, the Geneva Bible. Now, let me, let me just stop for a moment and just count these. We have Wycliffe, we have Tyndall, we have Coverdale, then we have Matthews, and now we have the Great Bible of 1539. 1539. Now, <clears throat> the perception of a strong Protestant bias was reinforced by an additional factor. The ordering of the books of the New Testament in Matthew's Bible followed the Lutheran practice of placing Hebrews, James, Jude and Revelation at the end of the New Testament and separate to it. Right. This reflected Luther's personal doubts concerning whether they ought to be actually included in the Bible. Matthew's Bible failed also to gain the acceptance that Grafton has expected. Thomas Cromwell realised that a new translation was needed to begin from scratch which would have been an enormous amount. The simplest solution was adopted. Cromwell asked Coverdale to revise the Matthews Bible with such changes as were required to keep influential churchmen happy. So they, they fluffed it. They changed it just to keep people happy. Uh, the new translation, which contained no offensive marginal notes, rapidly became the favoured Bible for use in churches and it was known as the great bible it was a large bible it included both the can canonical and the apocryphal books mistakenly referring to the latter as the hygraphia the new testament works were printed in the order set out by erasmus in his 1516 greek new testament with the four works regarded by luther as being of doubtful authority hebrews james jude and revelation fully integrated into the text. So the, the Great Bible was the first Bible in English that integrated these four books into the New Testament proper. The pattern set by the Great Bible became the norm for all subsequent English Bibles. The translation of the text offered by the Great Bible is best seen as a judicious blend of Tyndale and Coverdale with the offending notes of Matthew's Bible removed. The title page of the work was remarkable, revealing a piece of reformist iconography and is worth studying carefully. It represents a powerful visual statement of the place of the Bible in Tudor England. It brings out the close link between the church and the state um, and it has of course Henry top and centre and it has Thomas Cranmer and it has all the rest on the reverse of the opening page. This is the opening page. There we are. That's the opening page. You've got Henry in the top and centre. And you've got all the people gathered around him. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the title page is a classic example of image making. The page uh, projected was a unified nation under the monarch and under the Bible and the church and state working harmoniously together. This was the great thing that Henry was seeking to achieve. Now, a later monarch, James I, for James, political and religious unity were achieved through the person of the monarch and a single version of the Bible issued with royal authority. Now, the Geneva Bible was the Bible of the believers at the time. 
it was already there. It was exceptionally well produced. It was beautiful to look at. It was a proper study Bible and it had lots of helpful notes. It was produced by the believers, the English believers that lived at Geneva in Switzerland. It broke new ground. It set new standards in biblical translation and illustration and layout. Its numerous features such as marginal comments uh, propelled it to the forefront of English Bible translations at the time. By the time the King James Version was published, the Geneva Bible was the undisputed market leader. The Great Bible and its official inspired successors were powerless to meet the challenge posed by this new translation, which was the product of private enterprise and religious enthusiasm on the part of a small group of English Protestant exiles in the city of Geneva. They had done a tremendous work from the moment of its publication in 1611. The major challenge faced by the state-sponsored King James Bible was to displace the older and privately produced Geneva Bible. Now let me just say something here, coming to an end. The, the real believers, the real Christians of that day did not welcome the King James Version. It wasn't as well produced. It wasn't as beautiful to look at. It wasn't as convenient to hold because uh, the Geneva Bible was generally a smallish book. Um, this, was, this was a great, huge book that had to sit on a lectern because it was so heavy. And also, the King James Version had lots of mistakes and lots of little word typos and lots of errors which would need to be subsequently weeded out in later generations. The Geneva Bible that had the virtue of having many, many, many years of opportunity to revise it and to improve it. And so, if you were a true believer in those days, you had a Geneva Bible. That's what you had. And you couldn't obtain a great Bible and you couldn't obtain a King James Bible very easily because they were so difficult to manage. They were so big. And so we have this great problem, you know, the King James Version was not well received. And we're going to talk about that a little bit next time. We're going to talk next about the hard places um, of the Geneva Bible. Okay, well, have a great day and we'll catch up with you next time. Bye for now.